Good morning. Let me start. Uh, welcome to teaching ethical reasoning across the disciplines. And let me first introduce Vicky, Vicky Kiechel from uh, okay, from SIS. SIS, SIS. SIS <laughs> and uh, Sarah Hauser from uh, SBA, SBA government. Okay, uh, this is today's program. Uh, first, I want to give you some background of habit of mind courses and ethical reasoning courses. Then I want to provide some experience of uh, ethical reasoning course, a specific experience, my course, Econ 110 for Global Majority. And I want to give you some examples of interactive exercises, have some interactive exercises too, based on Econ 110. And then we will have Sarah's and Vicky's presentation. I also, we will also have towards the end then question and answers and discussion, but if you have uh, a question right away which you need to get solved before you can really follow, I'm of course happy to take any question any time if, you know, if it doesn't take too long of, uh, of answering it. Okay, uh, I have posted uh, some documents. It's not more of a blackboard site, but it's a conference site. And this, is, this PowerPoint is on the conference website, also the syllabus of Econ 110 for Global Majority of Fall 2018 is on that site. The guidance note for the discussion paper or research paper, uh, the learning outcomes worksheet, which was a requirement to get this course approved to be an ethical reasoning course. I have provided that for those of you who are interested and want to see an example of how I have done it and how it was approved and then there's a called supporting document and that's a document uh, which was also required to getting uh, Econ 110 approved to ethical reasoning and it has uh, information on the assignments, the descriptive paragraphs, the steps the department will take and a major selective prerequisites uh, issues related to Econ 110. Okay, note, the deadline if you are interested to submit an uh, ethical reasoning course, a proposal is February 15th this year. And let me give you a little bit background on the Habit of Mind courses. Habit of Mind courses, you probably know, are part of a new AU core. The AU core replaces the old previous general education program and one of the main reasons for revising the general program as you probably know was that students thought of it as an obstacle, as a requirement that they have to finish before they can focus on their, most, their more interesting topic what they really want to graduate in their major. However, as it actually turned out, the new AU core is actually implies actually more requirements in terms of credit hours than for old general education program. On the other hand, of course, the content is very different. So it's not really anymore. So if it's more credit hours, it is very different structured. So even quantity is more, the quality is also better. And it should not necessarily be seen as an obstacle which we have to take before really getting into fair, uh, fair areas and the courses which they want to take for their degree. Uh, for more general information about the AU core, you know there's a website you can look at and you know I'm not waiting now that you copy it down because you can search it or just get the PowerPoint uh, which is on the conference website. There are five habits of minds as you may know, uh, creative aesthetic inquiry, cultural inquiry, ethical reasoning, it's not outstanding, I just made it blue because it's a topic we cover, <laughs> and then natural scientific inquiry, uh, socio-historic inquiry, actually the difference is that it's ethical reasoning, everything else is inquiry, but anyway. Uh, starting with fall 2018, all the freshmen have to follow the requirements of a new AU core, and all new students have to take habit of mind courses, and they have to take one course for each of these five habits of minds. Um, these courses may be taken at any time during the degree program and again for general information about habits of minds there is again a website where you can of course find much more information. Let me just in, in inform you in case you don't know that actually faculty of all ranks may teach a habit of mind courses and that Courses may be offered at any level from 100 to 400, but all sections must be open to all students across the university. Therefore, it cannot be a major requirement, and uh, courses are, that are major requirements are not eligible to become habit of mind courses. 
major selectives, however, which are courses that students may take for their major credit, are eligible to become habit of mind courses. Yeah? Okay. As of December 2018, there were actually 42 courses that had been approved as habit of mind courses. In creative aesthetic inquiry, there were nine courses. In cultural inquiry, there were 10 courses. In ethical reasoning, there were only five courses approved for ethical reasoning. In natural scientific inquiry, there were also only five, but there were of uh, environmental science, 150, there were 15 sections of those, so they covered a lot of students uh, you know, who wanted to take uh, natural scientific inquiry. Socio-historical so, socio inquiry, there were 13 courses accepted, and in fall 2018, this is giving an overview for following ethical reasoning courses, we are taught for was American Studies 240, Poverty and Culture, there were two sections, with 38 students had taken that course, Econ 110 for global majority were also two sections, and I had 68 students in, in those two sections. Uh, philosophy 120, do the right thing, there were nine sections, and they had 164 students taking that. Philosophy 220, moral philosophy, four sections, 77 students, and then in sociology 210, power, privilege, and inequality, there were four sections, and 110 students had taken that. So if you add that all up, that's 457 students in in fall 2018 and recall that all these new students will need to take you know ethical reasoning courses so we have a kind of not enough courses offered for all those students who will need to take uh, ethical reasoning at some point while they are here at AU. Let me then now give you unless you have some important question right now Okay, let me then give you some of our uh, experiences, some information about how this course, Econ 110, has been approved as uh, being an ethical reasoning course. So I want to first give you just a tiny little background about Econ 110 for Global Majority. What is it? What is it about? Uh, how did Econ 110 finally get approved? Uh, some major changes in the contents of structure, which I had to make. Not that that is the only way to do it, but just as an illustration on how I had done it. And then again, the learning objectives are important, of course, uh, for ethical reasoning, and I want to not only give you the four learning outcomes, but also how I applied them again. Just an example, it's not like it's a perfect way of the only way, but that as an illustration. Uh, and we also have some examples and some interactive exercises uh, as I teach it in this course. Okay, so some background. First of all, the global majority may say, what is the global majority? The global majority simply refers to the at least 80% of the world population who live in developing countries. Yeah? And Econ 110, the global majority, has been taught at AU uh, at least since the 1990s. And I have been teaching this course, Econ 110, uh, every spring and every fall since fall 2009. So I'm teaching it basically 10 years every fall and, 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 sp and spring. And there has been no fixed contents when I took over the course. Okay, based on my experience, I was working for the World Bank, the African Development Bank, uh, UN organizations before I started to teach at AU. The department chair said, look, I trust you to redesign this course however you want. Uh, he was not probably too happy the way it was taught before, so he said, take whatever you want to do, and he said, L L I mean, take, I mean, teach how you think it's best, and that's how I basically redesigned the whole course. I spent a lot of time to fundamentally revise the course and building on students' comments, feedback. I also did some experimenting, trying this way and the other way and seeing how it works out. The course has been, over the last 10 years since I taught it, basically what I felt perfected, okay? It has been really been improved and improved all the time and I was so happy and students were happy with, with this course as well. Uh, students loved the course and many students took it because uh, they had recommendations from other students who took it previously. So how did I get Econ 110 to get approved as an ethical reasoning course? The answer is it was actually not that smooth. It was actually quite <laughs> tedious, it was lengthy, and in my personal opinion, it was kind of unfair. I don't want to go into too many details, but the guidelines and requirements, they were unclear, uh, they were evolved over time, uh, the explanations for the rejections didn't make sense to me at least, and it also seemed like that the committee chair for ethical reasoning did not seem to be 
too interested in having non-philosophy courses teaching ethical reasoning, which is, of course, philosophy and religion. How can any other discipline teach it? That's the impression I got. It's not true, but that's the impression I got. So Econ 110 had actually re rejected twice before having finally been approved in May 2018. And uh, the, the message, really, I want to confer here is that don't expect an easy approval. Okay, even if you adopt the suggestions which were given to you by the committee's feedback, it's not that straightforward. At least it was not for me. And after I had, you know, I when I submitted the, 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 the proposal and the details on what I want to do and so forth and so forth, I got feedback. First, I you know I went to the department to the ethical reasoning chair. I submitted the stuff before the deadline, and she gave me some feedback. And then I implemented all that feedback. And that's why I thought, okay, well, she gave me this feedback and I implemented it, so it should, it should pass now. So when I got the rejection, it has not been approved. I said, what? But I, I, I already got the approval indirectly, so why it has not been approved? So I was a kind of Surprised, I said, okay, this will not happen again. This time I will check much more carefully. I will be really revising the course fundamentally, even though I didn't have too much incentives because I thought the course was already great the way it was, and it was an ethical reasoning course to some degree. But I said, okay, I'm not taking any chances. I will revise it fundamentally, make it very different. Again, you know, had inputs from the ethical reasoning committee uh, members, and so on. I said, okay, this time it will pass. Again, second time it didn't pass. Neither. Again, they had new questions the new comments, oh, what about this and what about that? So at that point, I was a kind of fed up, to be honest. <laughs> and I said, wait, basically, we have three options now. One is that you tell me what you want, make the changes, and I'm happy to do it, whatever you tell me to do. That's one option. The other option is that, that you realize the course is actually very good, and it is an ethical reasoning course, and it should be approved as is. The third option we have is that somebody like the dean or the provost will review all the material, the guidelines, and how it has submitted it, and then they can make the decision if it is a ever reason or not. Now, that was then considered to be a threat. Okay, how can you write a threatening email like that? And I apologize, I apologize. Sorry, I didn't mean it that way. Okay, but that's how it was at that point. Anyway, the bigger question really is, okay, how much ethical reasoning theoretical concepts do people need to know, do students need to know, to make good ethical decisions. Yeah? And the way I see it, uh, very dry, I need mean, some coffee here. <laughs> the way I see it, the way I see it is, I'm guided by Article 1 of uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And as you may know, the first sentence of uh, Article 1 of the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that all human beings are born equal and with, with, uh, are born free and equal in terms of rights and uh, dignity. Now, that's not the sentence which I'm focusing on. It's the second one. And the second sentence of Article 1 says that human beings have a conscience. They have a conscience and people know what's good and what's bad. So for me, I interpreted that you don't necessarily need to have a lot of theoretical concepts about ethical reasoning to make good ethical decisions. Yeah, because we have a conscience, we know what's good, we know what's bad. What is actually more important is for people to know the facts. Because if you don't know the facts, if you don't know what poverty is in developing country, how inequality is at this point in the world, okay, you may make the wrong decisions, not because you don't know the ethical concepts, but you don't have sufficient information to make the right decision. Okay. That was a little diversion anyway. <laughs> so... I had to change the contents and the structure of Econ uh, quite a lot. This is how the old version was. Before it was an ethical reasoning court, it had four parts. In the first part, I had the key characteristics of the global majority, like that they are poor, that population growth and gender issues, uh, urbanization, all this stuff. Then I had a second part, which is specific topics, which are determine the lives of a global majority where are covered issues like agriculture, climate change, water scarcity, indebtedness of developing countries, microcredit, that they don't have access to credit. Then in part three, I looked specifically at the developing countries, at the developing regions, and I always picked one 
country of that developing region, like when I looked at East Asia, I looked at China, and, but I didn't only cover the region and the country, I connected one key development topic related to that country, like when I looked at China, we looked at the, you know, the, the, the different economic systems of capitalism versus, versus communism, when we looked at India, when we South Asia, we covered, uh, we looked at the structural transformation of the economies, from agricultural economies to industrial you know, service and so on and so forth. Anyway, too many details. Uh, and in the fourth part, then, I covered human dimension institutional policies, which are topic, co topics I covered there was human rights, globalization, and stuff like that. So there were about seven classes for each part. Uh, there was a midterm after the first two parts, and then there were actually two classes at, fair, at the very end, which were reviewing the most important from all you know, 26 classes, because every class was a new topic. I felt that it's important to have a review before uh, the final exam. Okay, now then I had to change it, and I changed it, as I said, in my view quite fundamentally, that I had now only two parts, and in the first part I cover the foundations, like the origins and the structures, and covers topics like the development ethics paradigm, ethical frameworks for decision making, human rights, global order, and so on and so forth. And there are about 10 classes, and every class I cover one of those foundations. And in the second part, I have now changed it instead of having one topic per class, I have now two classes for every topic. So there are eight topics which I cover, starting with poverty, inequality, uh, population growth and gender issues, and so on and so forth, and I have two classes for each topic. And the first class is giving students basically the background about poverty, and in the second one I then cover more of the ethical aspects of it. So this is how it has been redesigned, and uh, this is how it has finally been proved to be an ethical reasoning course. Okay, now, the, man the, the learning outcomes for the ethical reasoning, they are clearly defined, they are mandatory, you basically cannot even change one word in, in those learning outcomes, but of course you need to apply it to your course. And one is, I mean, different sequences, but one is re recognize the origins or structures of complex ethical issues, identify and differentiate ethical perspectives or questions. The third one is demonstrate ethical awareness by critically discussing and analyzing moral suppositions and fourth, apply ethical concepts and framework. And th this is how I applied these four learning outcomes to Econ 110. With regards to the first learning outcome, I said look in part one of this course and also in the second classes of those in part two, uh, we which we cover those specific eight topics which are important for the global majority, uh, those really provide the foundations and the necessary background, uh, which, you know, recognizing the origins. So that's how I have applied it, this first learning outcome, and based on required readings, which students have to read and summarize, not all of them, but some of them, before class in reflective summaries, uh, we then derive the origins and existing structures related to global majority in class via class discussions and so on and so forth. There are also bi-weekly quizzes and a midterm that will reinforce that students grasp these foundations. Yeah. With regards to the second learning outcome, identify and differentiate ethical perspectives. Uh, again, in part two of this course, we identify and differentiate ethical aspects by looking at eight specific topics like poverty, inequality, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, threaten, which threaten the lives of the global majority, and there are two classes, as I said, for each of these eight topics covered, and the first class allocated to each topic provides a necessary background, and then the second class allocated to each topic identifies and differentiates the ethical perspectives, and students have to write four reflective summaries, each identifying and differentiating the ethical aspects of one of these key eight topics. The third one, demonstrate ethical awareness by critically discussing and analyzing moral presuppositions Presuppositions. Pre okay. <laughs> Students will demonstrate ethical awareness by critically discussing and analyzing moral presuppositions of some key development issues in part two, basically just from the syllabus, what I have here. A combination of classroom. Okay, uh, I'm okay. I already, well, I have, I have two times 15 minutes. 
I have I have 30 minutes for my okay. Okay, I say that's fine. Okay, so if the fourth one, let me go a little bit faster. Apply ethical concepts and framework is basically a discussion paper or research paper, whatever you want to call it, where students need to, you know, apply what they basically learned about the ethical concepts in the framework, and they need to apply it to one of the eight topics specifically, and they need it also apply to one developing country specifically. So it's not all like that. Uh, let me just run through some examples and interactive activities. One key ethical question related to poverty uh, in developing countries, not poverty in industrialized countries, is does the global order hurt the poor? And based on the philosophical debates, uh, the answer to this question, among others, based on other more fundamental questions, is then related to do the world's resources belong, in some possibly rather weak sense, to humankind collectively? Yeah? And what I do, uh, I ask them, let's say you own a piece of land, and while drilling for geothermal heating system, you discover a gold mine 500 feet below. Who owns that gold? Okay. And the first idea may get, well, it's my land, but actually that's not true. Unless a piece of land comes with explicit mining rights, okay, that gold actually does not belong to you. Okay. At least in the US, and uh, in Germany it's even something like 10 feet, Anything below 10 feet, doesn't, you don't own it. Uh, anyway, and uh, another question, you may say, you own a piece of land, and the national government decided to build on an interstate highway through your land and wants to buy that land for more than fair compensation. Are you required to sell it, yes or no? So this is issues related to poverty, because who owns the resources, uh, who owns the fish in international waters? Well, okay, nobody, whoever catches them. But then you may say, well, is that really fair? I then divide the class into groups of three to discuss, shouldn't those fishermen have to pay something? Maybe to who, if they have to pay something? Should there be some limits on how much fish anybody can fish? Yeah, there actually are some national limits anyway. What about the climate, world's climate? Okay. Who owns Kenya's climate? which is getting harmed by greenhouse gas emissions of mostly rich people. It's not the poor people in Kenya who cause climate change, it's the rich people in industrialized countries. Yeah? And they destroy the climate, of course, globally, but especially the poorest people in the developing countries, in the poorest countries are the most vulnerable to climate change. And there's no compensation, really. Uh, this is what I thought as an exercise, but we really don't have the time for it anymore. Uh, let's look at Qatar. We could have looked at Qatar and looked at it. Uh, there are 300,000 people, and they own 0.05% of the world's, that's 0.005% uh, of the population. But this 0.005% of the world population, they own about 1% of the world's oil and natural gas resources. Yeah? Resulting in average income per capita of about $100,000 per person. That's the average. That's not like just the rich, no, it's the average. So we could have made four groups and we could have discussed, you know, does Qatar have a social, if not a legal, but at least a social obligation to share its wealth? Okay, you might consider, yeah. Ramifications are not going through, and we could have discussed that in five minutes. Uh, with regards to inequality, in the first class I cover, I cover inequality more for factual stuff. I also covered how different philosophers have reached different conclusions about the de desirability of inequality, and then I look specifically at two, and I don't have the time to go through this all, but anyway, uh, then I ask students to make groups and discuss if they agree with Rawls or if they agree with the libertarians or if they disagree with both. Uh, let me just give you a little bit background on inequality uh, like I do to them. What is a centibillionaire? I ask them, and a centibillionaire, they say, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a person who has net worth more than 100 billion. Yeah, that would be a centibillionaire. And say, well, there's probably no such person in the world who has more than 100 billion. Actually, no, there is, there is. And he's currently a lot of the news. He's the world's richest person in the world, and he owns $112 billion in 2018. Yeah? Now, as of 2016, just to give you a contrast, and give the students a contrast, the top 1% of the world's richest people, they own as much as 99% the rest of the world. And a handful of billionaires, this is what Bernie Sanders always points out, but it's not really coming from him, uh, he points out that a handful of billionaires, they own more than half of the world population. Okay, I'm wrapping up. 
Uh, some back on the inequality, again, you know, I have a lot of details, which is informative for them that inequality is not necessarily bad, inequality can be seen as an incentive to work hard and so on and so forth, but the way inequality has evolved over time, there are more and more people who come to the conclusion that for inequality to this level, what we have about inequality is actually harming growth, it's no more helping growth. So then, uh, you know, I'm looking again, have some discussion, discussions about it, and the last thing I could have looked at, I actually still have two minutes, uh, is trade and ethics, which is the eighth topic, uh, eighth topic um, which I cover, and you know, I go to some of the background, why trade is important, why economists think trade is important, and uh, uh, how can trade be unethical? And there are you know, various people who thought about it. Let me just give you one example. The first type, which is a kind of obvious one, like you know, trade in, 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 in human uh, body parts or you know, if people go for sex tourism to Thailand and child prostitution. That's trade in services. Yeah, that's probably most people would not consider that to be ethical. Uh, and there are many other examples, which again I'm not going through. Uh, but again, if we would have had more time, we could have made uh, a class exercise. Assume there is proof that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has ordered the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. Should the US stop trading with Saudi Arabia? Huh? Think about it. Things you may consider, like only stopping exporting of weapons, maybe stop importing oil, buy for oil from somewhere else, maybe both imports and exports, only if other countries or most other countries do it as well, otherwise it may not be effective. What are alternative solutions? Use a test. And this I did with a class, with the two sections I had, and I was actually shocked with the outcome because the class, they tended to argue no, we should continue, we should continue. Oh, you know, it has negative impacts on them, it has negative impacts on us. And I was shocked. I thought, no, if you have proof, okay, that he is guilty, we should do something about it. <laughs> but they didn't feel that in me. I was really surprised. I would have liked to see what this group thinks. But anyway, uh, that's basically what I wanted to present. Thank you. Okay, now I need to get out of this one. Do you have any questions before we go to the question and answer sessions? Yes. yes. No, you I was just going to say, did you find this revising the class with the class better or worse? I mean, for you, was it more enjoyable? Was it? Uh, did you feel like students got as much? I, I, for enjoyable. I, I like both ways. It's not like that I dislike this version or more of this version than the other one. Enjoyable, they are both equally fine. I mean, I would not have suggested it if I would not, you know, like to uh, have agreed to it to do it this way. I, I still think that to some degree, sometimes we cover like I tried to say in the presentation, that we may cover sometimes too many abstract ethical concepts and it's not really necessary for them to make good ethical decision on knowing, you know, five different ethical uh, frameworks about ethical decision making, which is abstract ethical frameworks, which, you know, they learn and then they forget in any case, even if they apply to some degree. I think it's more important that they know the issues than knowing the theoretical aspects of ethical reasoning. But anyway, you had a question? So were you, were you always interested in um, teaching or did your, you were doing the bank work and then kind of came into teaching? Yeah, I, I, I didn't think I really liked teaching that much. I was working at the World Bank and other organizations and then uh, I, I became, my wife and me, we came back from Tunis from African Development Bank because she was working at the IMF, she wanted to give up the job, and then I was having my own research organization, and then I said, well, it's actually nice to teach at AU, since I have my PhD from AU, to have, you know, as an adjunct instructor, to teach one class, and I taught uh, macroeconomics, Econ 100, and I loved it so much, and the students loved it so much, I had something like 6.8, uh, you know, course evaluation out of seven. Uh, they loved me, I loved it, and then I said, okay, I want to continue teaching. So I was continued teaching as an adjunct for two years, and then I became full-time. But I was always interested in kind of social justice issues. So even, so when, when I had the option to teach with global majority, I said, this is perfect, this is exactly. And that's why I always thought of it to be ethical reasoning class, and not, even though it didn't cover, you know, theoretical aspects. Thank you so much. I don't Sorry. Think we can have okay, yes, we can have more questions later on. <laughs> Let me get out of this one and let me close this. Okay.
Huh? I can't get it to. Oh, yeah. Can you get help? Yeah, sorry. Can you help me here. <laughs> Okay, so hi, I'm Sarah Hauser. Uh, I teach in SPA and in the government department. And so, uh, full disclosure, I am a political scientist, but I do political theory, so I'm more sort of naturally oriented towards uh, philosophy and things of that nature. Um, philosophers would say I'm not a philosopher, a political scientist say I'm not a political scientist. So I'm something in the middle, you know, um, but that makes this sort of task a little um, more uh, what I normally do. Um, and so that makes uh, developing a course, which I did for, um, uh, that was recently approved uh, for the ethical reasoning, um, m something more closer to what I, I normally teach. And uh, secondly, that I am also on the ethical reasoning subcommittee, uh, <laughs> the, the infamous subcommittee. And uh, <laughs> part of the uh, reason why we want to do this is so that we can obviously smooth out this process by which courses get approved. Um, so I wanted, and the part of the reason I think why this, um, you know, uh, confusion happens is because the learning outcomes, as we all know, are vague, right? And they're sort of intentionally vague in a number of different ways. Um, and I think what matters most is perhaps defining how, making clear to the committee how it is that you understand the meanings of the words and the learning outcomes. And that's probably what I'm going to be uh, talking most about. But I guess there will be two major points um, that I want to make before I get into the details of the learning outcomes. Um, and this is, has to do with the expectations of what ethical reasoning is um, in, the, in the view of the committee and how we can, um, well, sorry, how it might be different from the way in which some people normally think about ethics. So when people teach ethics classes, um, uh, or when we talk about ethical and unethical behavior, this is sometimes understood in terms of compliance. Um, that is, there's a set of rules or principles, like the code of conduct that's put forward by um, certain organizations, like the American Bar Association or the American Medical Association. And then the ethical question is, are you complying with this set of rules or are you not complying with this set of rules? And so then, according to these codes, certain behaviors can be understood and clearly categorized as ethical or unethical. Um, these codes of conduct can certainly be a part of and be taught in some ethical reasoning courses, but it's not primarily what ethical reasoning as a habit of mind involves, um, because what it involves is um, an assumption that ethics is not necessarily one thing, or that the claim of what's ethical and unethical is not obvious. It's something that has to be questioned. It's something that what we want the students uh, to challenge their currently existing ethical beliefs, to identify them, and to question them. So um, it's not obvious from the beginning what um, the requirements of ethics are. And so, for example, we had a business ethics course that was, pro um, um, which was approved this past semester, was it, Vicki? Yeah. Um, and that course involves some teaching of these kinds of codes, but it also involves a questioning of these codes and the underlying principles and, um, and ideas which underlie those particular uh, codes. So this is something that when you're doing a particular, if you're used to doing a particular kind of professional ethics, um, that we would want for an ethical reasoning course to expand beyond what you might normally um, consider to be a certain set of rules and compliance with those rules. Um, the second point has to do with ethical frameworks, um, which is learning outcome number four, which I'm going to sort of come back to. Um, the idea behind, I think, the ethical reasoning habit of mind is giving the students the tools they need to recognize and analyze ethical questions which they encounter in all aspects of their lives. Uh, this means that an ethical reasoning habit of mind course must provide students with ethical frameworks which they can apply both inside and outside the context of the particular topic of that course. Um, we want to give them some, and this is the idea behind all the habits of mind, I think, um, is and the reason for changing from the traditional distribution requirements to habits of mind is that we're teaching them a way of thinking which we're teaching them in the context of a particular subject a way of thinking <laughs> but the idea is that we could then uh, that they could then apply or use that way of thinking in all different aspects of their life so this is the same with uh, historical social inquiry those different other kinds 
And so that's what we want to teach the students with regard to ethical reasoning is when, first of all, to identify when they're making ethical decisions because they make them all the time and they don't realize it. Uh, they have certain underlying ethical presuppositions which they need to be exposed and explored. Um, and we need to give them a framework to some extent with, with which they can analyze those particular ethical situations that they encounter. And those frameworks can take lots of different forms, but that um, is, I think, uh, a key part of what's underlying um, an ethical reasoning, successfully completing an ethical reasoning habit of mind. Um, okay, so those two points, ethical frameworks and eth the relationship between ethics and compliance. Um, I just wanted to say also a brief word about normative versus descriptive ethics, um, which is something which comes up a lot depending on what discipline. This is something which comes up especially when you're talking about um, the disciplines of sociology or uh, psychology. Uh, so descriptive ethics involves the empirical research into ethical beliefs which people hold, why they hold them, how they come to make ethical decisions. Obviously this is empirical research and uh, there's certainly a place for that in ethical reasoning, in the ethical reasoning habit of mind. Um, we can distinguish this from normative ethics which is the question, exploration of the question of how people ought to act regardless of whether or not they do in fact act that way. Right, so just separating the basic normative and empirical questions, we just call them descriptive ethics and normative ethics. Um, so common theories of normative ethics, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, deontological, etc. Um, so some ethical reasoning classes will deal with questions of descriptive, descriptive ethics, um, not all of them. Like I said, we just approved a psychology class last semester which had a whole section on descriptive ethics, um, how it is um, the study of the brain and how people think it is that they make ethical decisions, why they feel certain ways, they feel empathy. Um, but all courses have to make some engagement with the questions of normative ethics as well as descriptive ethics. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, so these are the learning outcomes. Um, and I've highlighted the words in red, um, which I think are uh, vague, and which can mean a lot of different things. And what I found, so my experience of, even though I'm on the committee, I didn't get to vote on my own course. This is the way it works, right? And so my course got rejected the first time too. And I thought, wow, okay, this is strange. <laughs> um, but I think it was, uh, it forced me to make some changes to the course, which I think have made it a lot better of a course. But what I realized was um, it's very hard to tell from just from a syllabus and even from the kind of uh, narrative statement that I had to give what it was that I was thinking when I read these learning outcomes. And so what I did was, and when I resubmitted it, the first version of the course was um, called the Quest for Justice. It was sort of a general justice-oriented course with different topics. Um, and in the second version, I narrowed it down to the question of justice and citizenship. Um, and what I did then was go through the assignments that I had um, and show what the, I thought those different words meant in terms of the assignments that I was giving. So this is just my brief uh, course description. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, which basically, there are two basic uh, theoretical models of citizenship within the history of political thought, the liberal model and the republican model. And they have representatives both in classical, political theory, and in contemporary. And so basically the first half of the semester, I examine the liberal versus, um, versus uh, uh, Republican models of citizenship. And then in the second half of the semester, I just problematize those with questions of gender, race, and nationality. Um, so what I did when I was making up my assignments was to say what I thought, like I said, these different ethical perspectives were. So perspectives or questions can mean a lot of things. So when I wrote my midterm exam, I'm normally on a syllabus, I would only put the first part, right? That's um, the unitalicized part. But when I was writing a proposal, I had to explain what sort of my thinking was. So I said, the purpose of the midterm exam is primarily to test the student's understanding of the two models of citizenship. These two models constitute two different ethical perspectives between which the students must differentiate. Um, and thus is meant to test their progress towards the completion of learning outcome one. Um, 
So basically, ethical perspectives can mean a lot of things. For the purposes of this course, I was looking at the two different ethical perspectives on the question of citizenship, the Republican model versus the liberal model. Um, and those were the two that needed to be differentiated. Um, okay, so moral presuppositions, the second learning outcome involves getting people to uh, questioning, teaching students how to question moral presuppositions. Um, so the first thing to say about this is uh, it does not say in the learning outcome whether these moral presuppositions that they're questioning ought to be their own or other people's. I think some people read it with the intention of seeing it, of getting the students to question their own moral presuppositions. Other people read it with the question of getting students, uh, students reading a text and then trying to pull out the author's underlying moral presuppositions. Either of those things is fine. Um, it's just uh, you have to, well, I guess be identifying where and how exactly they're going to do that. So with the first paper um, and the first reading, we uh, uh, reread uh, Socrates in the Apology and Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail. And so the first paper is describe your understanding of what it means to be a good citizen. Is there necessarily a tension between being a good human being and being a good citizen? Are Martin Luther King and Socrates good or bad citizens according to your definition? So my way of looking at this was in part to introduce the idea of, of citizenship as an ethical question, um, but then to get, this is my way of getting them to pull out in the very beginning of the course their own underlying moral presuppositions about what it means to be a good citizen. Um, and so that's specifically what this assignment is meant to test so, and I, and, I showed, and I said that specifically in my description of the assignment. Um, okay. Uh, origins and structures. Depending on what kind of course you're used to teaching, you're going to have uh, greater trouble with one or the other of these learning outcomes. Uh, origins and structures is less what I normally do. So um, those two things obviously can mean a lot. Uh, this is their second paper, describe and explain how the historical oppression of women and minorities complicates and challenges both the liberal and republican models of citizenship. Um, so basically, uh, we're, you're taking a theoretical model of citizenship and you're trying to apply it to a case in which you have certain historical circumstances um, with, of oppression which have created the situation in which we now ask this ethical question. So that origins and structures means looking at the way in which those uh, problems have come to be, how we've gotten to um, the place where we're needing to ask this ethical question, and how that might change our theoretical approach to the ethical question by looking at those origins and the structural structures within society that, affect, that might affect the answer. So this is really a sort of coming together of theory and practice kind of uh, question that they're doing in this therapy. Uh, frameworks or concepts is the final learning outcome. So my take on final thing um, is I ask them to write an essay. In an increasingly globalized world, the liberal and republican models of citizenship are no longer applicable and should be replaced with a cosmopolitan model of citizenship. That's the question. They have to agree or disagree with that statement. And I see this final exam as testing all four of the learning outcomes in some sense. So that's what I did was I went and said exactly how I saw that as being the case. Uh, the students must identify and differentiate the ethical perspective of the immigrant or potential immigrant. That's the first thing. They must articulate their own understanding of what a good citizen is. So that's the second learning outcome. They must describe how the context of globalization complicates the question of citizenship. That's the third origins and structures learning outcome. And they must apply their own understanding of good citizenship to the ethical dilemmas posed by living in a globalized world. That's the fourth learning outcome. That's the application section. So obviously your assignments can um, uh, and should hit on uh, more than one of the learning outcomes. Um, basically, I think it comes down to just revealing what your thinking is behind each of the assignments and how specifically you see that assignment reflected in the learning outcomes. And I'm making a lot of emphasis on assignments and I think that's important um, because uh, the assignments, I'm not going to say the assignments matter 
more than the content. That's not quite it. But um, in terms of meeting the learning outcomes, there has to be an assignment which shows the student's progress towards each one of the learning outcomes. And it has to be clear how that exactly is happening. Um, and you know, just like when students write papers and their reasoning is clear in their own head and it's not clear in the paper, we all have that experience of reading students' papers. I found that when I wrote my syllabus, it was very clear in my head, but even my colleagues on the committee, it wasn't clear, I wasn't making it clear how I was thinking about these things. Um, so if, that's why I went through and I actually quoted words from the you know, learning outcomes and says these are the ethical perspectives I'm trying to differentiate. These are the framework, this is the framework that I'm talking about here. Um, and if that's done, then you can uh, do, do this with lots and lots of different kinds of content. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. Um, I think that's all I have specifically for my presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions right now? Or we can go into Vicky's, yes. I, for me, it looks like the issue is it's going to be with the course assessment. Yes. How, how are you going to assess the course? And are you going to use rubrics? For me as a student, not as, as a professor, as a student who came to your class. For example, I came to Ben class, uh -huh. and um, I am a Republican student. Uh -huh. And I don't believe in climate change at all. That is my ethics. Mm -hmm. Can I use that? And how are you going to assess me and my ethics in your course? compared to other students who will be radically different from me. How are you going to assess that? There is no, my, my understanding, there is no one ethics. The ethics here and in Europe and in China is different and it's based on the culture of the student, it's based on, and if, if you talk, especially if you teach in this course as a global mm -hmm. course. Yeah, so I think that uh, it doesn't matter what the student's own sort of ethical positions are, they are evaluated on the question of whether or not they should still be able to apply an ethical framework even if it isn't their own. That would be my first uh, response to that, is that that's what you're teaching them how to do um, in one sense, is to apply a certain ethical theory to a certain set of facts. Um, the other thing is that um, the students have to be encouraged to examine their own ethical positions, whatever they might be, um, they, and to expose them and, ex and examine them. And I don't think that we're necessarily thinking, that I, I want students to come to any particular ethical conclusion. That wouldn't be um, the right answer. It, the idea would be that we want them to be able to think in an ethical manner in a coherent, logical, and clearly applied manner. And most students have a set of ethical beliefs that are not coherent and not, not logical. We all know this. And so what we want to try to encourage them to do is to try to develop a set of ethical beliefs which are more coherent for themselves. But I'm not saying no professor, I think, uh, should be requiring any sort of them to come to any kind of ethical conclusions. I mean, the question was, are you using rubrics in your courses? How you, how you prove to me that this course qualifies for ethical reasoning? Mm -hmm. How you assess that? Well, does it, uh, does it um, fulfill the learning, out does it have um, assignments that fulfill the learning outcomes is like the first sort of big. Uh, one, and is it teaching students the general sort of theory of ethical, uh, the idea of ethical reasoning, that is that they should be able to take an ethical, uh, you know, create an ethical theory, take it and apply it in a certain place. So the rubric is the learning outcomes. But like I said, um, the learning outcomes can be a bit vague and we're open to lots of different interpretations of learning outcomes. We just want to know what yours is. I think that's the basic idea. Yes. Hi. Um, so I teach the sociology class, Power and Privilege, and mm -hmm. it's an ethical reasoning course. And um, I have a question about the comment you're making about normative versus descriptive. Mm -hmm. Because that was probably the biggest challenge for me mm -hmm. in teaching the class um, as an ethical reasoning course for the first time of the semester. Um, and on the one hand, I taught the class um, previously for about two years, and I realized teaching as an ethical reasoning course, I had was actually doing a lot of ethical reasoning in the first place. But I found it hard to address the normative part. Mm -hmm without pulling in a lot of readings from philosophy. Mm -hmm. And I know in talking to the committee and the committee chair that that wasn't necessarily expected, but it was really hard to do it without that because sociology doesn't really you know, have a lot of these ethical 
frameworks, that, it, that empirical evidence that sociologists produce helps to mm -hmm. inform people's ethical stances. But um, so I don't know, it, it, is that really something that's expected or, um, you know, it, it, that, that was probably the biggest challenge for me, especially because I tried to lay that out in the name of the semester. Finding readings was a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, also, because it was sort of out of my um, discipline, it was, a, it was a lot of prep. Um, yes. It is. I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, there have to be some kinds of normative ethical frameworks, I think, in order to teach ethical reasoning adequately. Um, we're having a, um, it's faculty, we're having a faculty development um, workshops and things like that to help people with this. Um, and it just depends, I think, a lot on your level of comfort. Um, no one's expecting, you know, that you have to uh, sort of, you know, read all of Kant or something like that in order to teach uh, teach this. But there has to be some engagement with normative ethics, and if that's not something that is um, of uh, if you're that you're not comfortable with at all, um, then I think that this is um, going to be pretty difficult for you. But and it, there will be sort of uh, more prep. But we're we're really focusing on trying to help faculty with that and get faculty. Uh, and that's why we're running this faculty development workshop this semester. And we will be doing uh, it further. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so just one more thing. so I went to the first session of that and it was really helpful. But it might just be helpful. I, I don't think that was clear to me when I was proposing mm -hmm. um, that that was really because it was more like no, you can just you know engage with your discipline. And I found that really like I did have to bring in a lot. Of yeah, I mean, there's there's normative frameworks within different right. disciplines, right? right? Um, and so it's not necessarily just philosophy, but it is theory, right? I mean, a normative framework is going to be a theory. That's what, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Uh, I'll continue some of these themes. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see. Transfer is how. Sir, do you? So I'm Vicki. Yep. Um, I'll try to condense into about 10 minutes, leave time for more questions, general questions. But I'm the sort of come hither presenter. We want you to do this. Um, you know, Sarah had mentioned this also, Ben. Uh, this, there's a difference between ethics and ethical reasoning, right? So almost, if you think about what ethical reasoning is in terms of framing or ways of modes of thought, Almost any dis discipline can, can engage uh, and become an ethical reasoning course. So it's really, it's like the father in my big fat Greek wedding, you know. Give me a word and I'll show you how the root of the word is Greek. You know, give me a course and I can show you how your course can be a habits of mind ethical reasoning course. And I'm serious about that. The other thing to this question about normative ethics, you know, this is, I would argue, really an imaginative pursuit also and a creative one, and it is up, I think, to us, if we're struggling with these issues, is to find sources other than in just strictly philosophy to rely on. And we'll look at, in, I'll show you some other course descriptions from other universities, um, and we'll see if there's anything that kind of piques your interest. Um, so benefits, I also want, there are benefits. Um, yeah, our students need it, our society needs it, um, you know, it will enhance, you know, the rigor and imaginativeness of your own courses and scholarship. I think that's a huge benefit. Um, and then this question that Ben had raised, you get to teach all kinds of students across AU if you do this, and that is great. I taught my first complex problems course, and that was a huge benefit and fun. Um, so you get outside your silo. Um, and yes, if you base your teaching on discussion in these case study exercises, um, where you 
ask students to activate their learning through these exercises, your sets, your, your evaluations do improve, I think. And then if you're term faculty, if you're adjunct faculty, you have this job security issue, right? So if you're teaching in the core, all hail the core, that is like an <laughs> argument for retaining you. So, you know, come on, teach this. <laughs> Um, so who's, who's teaching ethical reasoning? I put up the Weston book, Elon, Great Quaker Institution, uh, Quakerism, the last mystical religion maybe uh, in American life. But anyway, we use this in the, the you know, sort of uh, exploratory committee. Um, so let's look at what we can learn from other examples here. Stanford and Duke do a lot of these courses. They have requirements as we now do. Um, my, this is the last little sub-bullet is anecdotal. The balance of courses is, are taught by non-philosophers. I'm, I'm an architect teaching in the global, and proudly teaching the global environmental politics program at SIS. I'm not a philosopher uh, of the obvious kind, maybe. But um, anyway, in my research about, you know, who's teaching it, where these courses live, it's non-philosophers teaching it. So here are some examples. One of my favorites, Shakespeare, The Ethical Challenge. So, you know, have a look at the course description. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. You know, can we divorce ethical decisions from the contingencies of experience? That's like so embodies Shakespeare and Shakespearean plays and often the kind of crux of the plays. You know, we'll ask a series of normative ethical questions to do with pleasure, power, old age, sacrifice, and truth-telling, and attempt to answer them in relation to the dramatic situation of Shakespeare's characters. Anyone here from literature, comp lit, or English? Ah, yay! <laughs> OK. Another example, literature and global health. I mean, again, this is perhaps when you think about uh, you know, coming into this from the point of view of more um, maybe usual um, um, disciplines to, to teach ethical reasoning, I think global health is, is more of an obvious one. But the linkage in this case between literature and global health, I think is unusual and quite powerful. And um, you know, the fact that the, I did not know the editor-in-chief of The Lancet uh, had a call for a literature of global health. I'm going to milk that for all it's worth in my gateway course in environmental sustainability and global health. But you can see the variety of authors that they're using um, here. Everybody from, you know, Fennel, Pedagogy of the Press, to Paul Farmer and his, you know, sort of work in Haiti and everything like that. Another example. Complet Middle East Two, looking at the idea of two ethical pathways, mysticism and rationality. I put up, this is uh, Avicenna, uh, who was a Persian philosopher. I forget what his actual Persian name is, but. Ibn Sina. Thank you. Excellent. Um, you know, really interesting kind of polymath. Um, so, you know, that's an interesting sort of way into this subject. What would we do differently today? Again, kind of this idea of calling on students to think about this activated. You know, we certainly organize knowledge differently, but do we think about ethics in the same way? Moving on. This is more typical, um, living more within the sort of straight philosophical realm, but this course, as I recall it when I, you know, took it off uh, this university website, is not one offered to philosophy students, but rather to other students. So I loved its questions. I mean, again, it gives you an idea of the liveliness that is, you know, possible here, you know. You go from how should we live our lives to should you be digging wells rather than taking philosophy classes? You know, sort of, you know, who says that this is the way it should be? You know? Um, the question of blame. Earth sciences, this is taught within hard sciences. Again, this is more analogous to some of the courses that we do in global environmental politics at SIS, but I mean there's beautiful writing 
um, you know, to do with the ethics of stewardship and environmental uh, studies. And, you know, this obviously draws on it. This is a Stanford course. I, I um, am interested that we now own Airly as a farm. I don't know if this is transferable. They, they mentioned their Stanford educational farm. I don't know if it's transferable somehow in the future. If anyone's here from, you know, the hard sciences and, and wants to, you know, take a shot at this with respect to our own farm, I think it's great. Computers, ethics, and public policy. Again, the idea of looking at, I think, interestingly, taking ethics and focusing on what this instructor defines as the problem areas in computers. Privacy, reliability, risks of complex systems. Very interesting. That's an idea of kind of application that um, I think is vivid. Um, ethics and politics in public service. Again, this is, this is, you know, sort of more, uh, I guess, um, maybe usual or expected, but I think it is uh, an interesting take because so many of our students, for example, at SIS go into public service, but certainly this whole question of volunteering, you know, volunteerism <coughs> is something they engage in regularly. There could be a lot of, of, of interesting thinking done in this school uh, around, in this university around this. Ethical issues in engineering won't linger here, but I do think it's interesting that, um, you know, they're, they're taking this, this, this kind of, they're, they're not only taking frameworks, they're actually taking this sort of code of ethics thing, they're combining them in this sense. This one, here's the statue of Adam, oh, guilt, <laughs> guilt. So, Constructing a course around an idea, you know, guilt. Um, Paul Wapner's in the audience. Suffering, another kind of thing that you have focused on, Paul, in your scholarship in the past. You know, you could do a kind of thematic hinge for this as well. But I think guilt is, is I certainly grew up with enough of it, so I'm delighted <laughs> to, you know, see it put to this good use. What on what is intolerable? I love courses that teach about failure. I, I try to teach about failure whenever possible. Um, and this is really, you know, right there. Um, you know, asking you, asking the students to really consider this question of what is intolerable. You know, I'm sure that there is a, an, a, this question again of how you define failure. Again, it's very much this question of framing. <laughs> very much an ethical question. We have the business school, not this business school, but um, this I found interesting because um, they clearly offer guest speakers on a variety of topics. I mean, this is, would be another way to um, construct a habits of mind ethical reasoning course here is to really base it around guest speakers. How fun for you and how fun for them. As long again as you had these exercises and assignments that actually kind of again activated their learning, you could do it. It would be cool. Arts, anyone from Katzen? Please. Yes! <laughs> Katzen! So, there are a lot of, this is one being done in Australia, actually. This is not an American university. But, you know, I think, you know, it's, 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 an, the arts is, I'm so glad in the last five years to see the movement away from, it's not STEM, it's STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. I mean, I think this is this connection. I, Received for Christmas the biography by Walter Isaacson of Leonardo. You know, there's a you know Renaissance you know argument for this. But anyway, here's here's a course description having to do with this. And then you know, last there is a course on ethical reasoning and the aesthetic experience, also in arts. I put up. I mean, I was just imagining. This is part of it. This is a J.M.W. Turner painting. This is one that I saw when I was. 15 or 16 years old, it had come in a, I'm a native of this place, Washington, D.C., it had come in a traveling exhibition, 
I was standing in front of it awed and just taken in by the beauty of it until I actually understood that he had written a poem directing me to observe that this was a slave ship throwing overboard the dead and dying who were pictured in this beautiful depiction of nature, um, you know, and their chains. Um, you know, again, this idea of kind of, you know, what is that relationship between aesthetic experience and then this kind of ethical reasoning or realization of, you know, your value system of right and wrong of enslavement. An experience I obviously never forgot. Okay, so how can we help you? In our post-Ben <laughs> reconfiguration, um, we, the committee, and I sit with Sarah on the committee, I think it's, you guys, it's so valuable to have your perspective as having constructed these courses, but you know, there's support for you if you want to do this. We'd much rather support you on the front end with brainstorming, it makes much less work for us. We hate like saying, no, go back, revise. We can help you with brainstorming, uh, we can help you with you know, your course development support, with pre-review, and of course with revisions. And then there's starting to be ongoing contact opportunities within the ethical reasoning teaching uh, community at AU. And there will be more of those. Alex Breeding has just you know, set up a sort of a, a lunch for folks to talk. So please join us in this um, movement. Um, are there, we have eight minutes left, is that right? Um, so I'm told to make sure that you take course evaluations and pencils. There's little, you have to do that as, or you're invited to do that. You're strongly encouraged to do that. Drop them in the box before, don't take them away with you. So please do that. But now let's have questions for anybody or just general observations. Yeah, my question is about the readings and the syllabus before and after and how, trans how big transformation is, like how, like, do you change the syllabus readings fundamentally, or like how, what is the, like? It depends on what class, I mean, okay. it depends on what class you're talking about. If it, it, like, because my class was a totally new one, uh -huh. but I was taking one that he'd already done. Uh -huh. So um, if you're making, uh, you're thinking about taking a, an existing class and changing it, is that? Yeah. Okay. I uh, changed about two thirds. I kept one third and two thirds I changed because I couldn't cover all the other topics anymore. So the first whole first part is all, you know, philosophical aspects of, of uh, you know, poverty, inequality, and, and stuff like that. Basically, the foundations of ethics, which I cover on that's, that's I didn't never taught before. And then in the second part, when I have always two classes, the first is again, is what I had before, but the second is then applying this ethical aspects to that specific topic, which is also again a new reading typically. It yeah, doesn't I mean, have to be that extensive, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm Jessica Waters. I work closely with the Almighty Corps. Um, so a question for you, and particularly um, to Ben. One of the things that we have struggled with is getting faculty to, um, as you pointed out, engage early on so that the process is not painful. So we've been trying to come up with, you know, what can we do to, for example, should we put on two-day workshops where faculty come for two days and they sit down with the committee and they work through their syllabus and they work through the course proposal, there's a guarantee at the end of those two days that their course is going to be approved, you know, provided they have engaged in the thing. Um, and we've gotten mixed reactions to that. We've had some people say, no, I'm not giving you a day of my time or two days of my time. Other people have said, that would be great because I don't have this painful back and forth process and we have this collaborative effort at the same time. So I'm curious, as someone who um, has been critical of the process, whether something like that would have been um, interesting to you or whether you think it's something we should pursue. I think it would have been interesting. I mean, for me, if the issue was that I, I, I shared what I proposed before finally submitting it and then I got some feedback and I thought I have implemented that feedback and I still get a rejection and then I thought okay that happens twice but not a second time and second time it still happened so I just didn't know what they want I really didn't know what they want and I really had the feeling that you're just discriminating because it's not philosophy mm -hmm. that's I mean it's probably not true but that's really the impression I got mm -hmm. so I think it would be useful to have some kind of workshop explaining to potential faculty who wants to teach this course on what we really, how we, and it may be, as you said, you know, I mean, Sarah said that 
in the syllabus, it just didn't come across what I had in mind. It was not like that. It probably was not fair. It was fair, and for me, it was class clear, but for them, it was not clear at all. So that's why I'm wondering if we had yeah. some, you know, you give us a bit of your time, we sit down and do this. Yeah, I would do that, exactly. admittedly. Yeah. I mean, if you don't know what to do and you just get rejected and you say, I don't know what to do anymore, what do they want? <laughs> you know, that the workshop is definitely much more helpful. And I don't think that two days spending, because all the revisions and uh, formulating and writing up, it's much more than two days. So I don't think that two days is an issue at all. Okay. We'll look for you to be an ambassador. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I have two interrelated questions, and I'm trying to resist the temptation to make this into an ethics course in itself. But did the committee or did any of you think about uh, whether the structure of the requirements is reinforcing a cultural standard of ethics in itself? In other words, like, I bet, uh, Dr. Gunder, you mentioned something like, the, I think you said something like the structure of ethics. And I thought a lot about that, like the unexamined intellectual assumptions that we make that lead into that. Um, but for instance, right, like I think of the issue of honor killings, which I have friends work that issue. I mean, the ethical problem of honor killings assumes that the rights of an individual supersede the rights of a tribe or a family, right? Or it, is, and it assumes that um, honor is a subsidiary value to, for instance, freedom or life. So I just wonder if there's a discussion. Oh, sorry. In the in the committee, in, in the committee or in the formulation of the course, do you like how how deep do you dig to try to understand whether the questions you're asking are in fact reinforcing a particular paradigm? I I mean I think that you're invited to to definitely that would be a question that I would ask if I was teaching that subject. Um, that you know uh, it's not obvious. Uh, mm -hmm. So we think of it as a problem, but from what perspective are we thinking of it as a problem, right? We're thinking of it as a problem because we're looking at it in terms of human, the, uh, from the point of view of individual rights. And if you look at it from a more, uh, you know, communitarian way of, um, of ethics, then it would be completely different. So I would think that that would be something that you would definitely examine when you examine uh, that question to, in order to give it a full exploration. Um, I'm not sure if that really answers your question. It's a tough question. It's a tough question. I mean, I'm not going into, into t too many details, but I always try to emphasize that there are, there is not one correct way, okay, to, to approach an issue like climate change, okay, that it is different interests and there is a conflict of interests and which one finally you know, overwhelms and, and gets through, that's not necessarily that clear based on ethical issues. It's kind of epistemological question. Right? Yeah. Mm. How do you even... But you don't have to settle the epistemological no, no, question no, no. when you're teaching I, the I class, right? right? I mean, you almost have to accept the definition of certain words to include the words in the requirements which go into the syllabus. Like individual yeah. phrases. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's Except there's such a thing as an individual. Yeah, I think that's yeah. unavoidable. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, I'm Mark Schaefer. I'm the university chaplain. I'm also an adjunct in CAS. And it seems impractical that on some level every course of university could become an ethical reasoning <laughs> course. Yes. But it also seems important that every course in the university is a course that engages in ethical reasoning and that trains our students up to be morally and ethically reflective. So I guess my question for you is what advice would you have to help faculty, regardless of whether the course itself can become an ER course, to infuse ethical reasoning into their syllabi, yeah. into, into their course content. That's a great charge. That's more of a charge to us to do that, I think. I, I don't know that we can answer that right now, but I think that's, <laughs> that's excellent, you know. Um, we should, I think yeah. trying to encourage them to, uh, you know, be systematic in their ethical reasoning, in anything that they sort of think about it is the best way to get them to answer those questions. Because when we have students' debates um, about topics, that they, they can be kind of a free-for-all, you know, like, and uh, this is my view, and that's my view, and just assertion and counter-assertion. 
So anything you can do to get them to sort of try to formulate some sort of coherent uh, thought process when they're talking about ethical questions is what I always try to do. If, uh, do we have an onboarding process for faculty that's consistent across the disciplines here? I mean, I'm not sure that we do. That would be a place to try to reinforce this. I mean, we don't have an orientation for us like our undergrads do, I assume. <laughs> I mean, I didn't. We, we do. We do, but do it's we? more like... It's more like yeah. human resources question. So that would be a, an excellent place to try to embed exactly this kind of thing. All right, I think we're actually out, out of time. time. But if, yeah, anybody <laughs> wants you. to please return your evaluations. Thank you.